This is the Lean Builders Hoots on the Ground podcast with absolutely, positively no bullshito. Join us as we dig into exactly what lean construction is and how we can use these concepts and strategies in the field. This podcast will be different as we journey to job sites and mine the minds of lean builders, all in effort to pass forward building knowledge from those who have put their time in to learn a better way. Because that's just what lean builders do. What's up, y'all? Adam Hoots here, the lean builder. Hoots on the ground with no bullshito. And I'm coming to you today with my man, Sir George Hunt. How are you, Sir George? I am doing fantastic, Mr. Hoots. How about yourself? Not bad. Sorry, I just deemed you, sir, like right there in the intro. I hope that's okay. That's fine by me. I don't know if the the British royalty will have anything to say about it, but it's fine by me. This is the lean royalty with the the old Sharpie. I I deemed you Sir George Hunt. Uh, No, I'm super excited for our conversation today. I, I always love talking with you. I'm constantly learning with you. Help us understand, help us figure out who George Hunt is. Tell us who you are. Sure. So let's see. I mean, it, it's a loaded question for me because I never really do a great job of talking about myself. But so I guess, who am I? It, at the heart of everything, I think I'm I'm a very curious person who likes to learn. And yes, you can insert the jokes about my name being George and Curious George. It's fine. But I think that that kind of drives at the heart of it is that I am a very curious person and I like to learn about things. So even from when I started in the industry is once I got beyond the original shy factor of do I actually, or can I actually walk up to folks and ask them what is going on? I think I took every opportunity to do it. And I think that's what I continue to do is each and every day is try and find something. If I don't know what's going on, poke my head in, ask some questions about it, ask what people are doing so I can understand better because I think I want to know as much as I can, even if I don't have to use it, you can ask my friends and my wife that I have a lot of useless knowledge in my head. If you want to sit next to me while we're playing Jeopardy, I can usually do pretty well because there's a bunch of random knowledge in there that I probably will never use. But yeah, so that that's, I think, the heart of it, who I am. And then to build on it, I think I like trying to use that to help other people do their jobs better, right? I think we, in, in our industry, both design and construction, I think... We, we're, we're so used to stressing about a lot of stuff. We're so used to having it adversarial. And I think what I like to do and I find most rewarding is really just kind of giving people an outlet and giving people, you know, ideas in ways and either coaching or teaching or giving them new tools, whatever it is, finding them ways to help them do their jobs better, safer, faster to reduce some of that stress. Cause I think at the end of the day, no one actually wants to go to work and be completely stressed out all the time. They want to have a good experience. They want to be able to go back home when they need to. And then everything that goes on with our industry that a lot of people talk about with the the respect for people part and everything else. I think that's, that's kind of what I enjoy doing is helping people do what they're here to do better and faster and easier. Where does that come from, do you think? It's a great question because I think part of the part part of what I've realized with myself is that, you know, I don't think I was always so outward towards other people. I think that it, it's something that definitely has evolved with me through college and then out of college into the industry and everything else where I think I used to be a very guarded, introverted type of a person where I would try to do everything absolutely by myself and very independent and trying to, I'm going to do it on my own. I don't need help kind of a thing. And I think the more and more I realized that you can't do it on your own, it started to make me think. I know that when I started, there wasn't a whole lot of people who were directly reaching out all the time and saying, Hey, let me help you with that. I was fortunate enough to have some great mentors and things, but in general, I think it wasn't always there. And so I think part of it for me was that, well, you know, if I can reach out a little bit and help those kind of get there for me, I don't know, it's just something that ended up developing and then realizing that, Hey, I kind of like doing this much rewarding for me. So that's awesome, man. I love to hear it for some reason, for me, it's a lot easier to do that. I think you said, what did you say? 
you said easier to be outward for me on a job site that is way more easier for me than at home or like even in my neighborhood i'm not super outward when i come home it's like i don't hey john hey timmy hey jorge like that's not for me that's not i'm not a uh let's go out and wave to everybody kind of person at home. But on the job site, it's different, right? Like, and I don't know, maybe it's the respect for people or, or maybe it's the overly lack of respect for people on the job site is the reason I over encourage. I don't know. How, how do you act on job? Like, do you find that similar? No, I think so. I think it, it's, I mean, it all kind of depends too. I think I find it easier to do on the job site as well. I think just because I don't know, I kind of feel at home on the job site. It, it, it it kind of feels, I like hearing whether or not you can hear it through the microphone or not. I am on a job site. I'm kind of sitting outside our trailer, but I love hearing the, the backup alarms of all the equipment that are going on over there. They're, they're raising steel over on one side of the building, putting panels up on the other. Like that noise to me is comfortable. And I think when you're in an environment that's comfortable, that's where it kind of can come out. And so I think for me as well, similar to you on in our own neighborhood and things like that. Like I'm not always the most friendly when it comes to neighbors and saying hi and everything else. And I think that still is for me, it's still part of that introverted nature for me, but I feel like I can be myself a little bit more when I'm on the job site. Just, I don't know, it's comfortable. I like being here, but I think it, part of it too, is that I, I find it a little more rewarding when I'm out here on a job site at work and you can see things kind of going together. So I like to talk to the people who are actually putting this stuff together and, and kind of being outward and, and talking with folks about it just because, I mean, whether you're in construction or not, it, it just going out to a job site and just watching all this stuff happen, like it's some cool stuff. And it's like seeing seeing steel getting raised by a crane and then there's a couple people on top there both in the thing together and you're like, they're crazy. They're up there 70, 80, 100 feet, however many stories there are up there. It's just some cool stuff to watch. So no, I think that's it. I think it's, it's the comfortable ability asked about being out here on the job site for sure yeah it's it's kind of that calm and chaos right it, it may seem like chaos but when where everything is when what everything's going on everybody that's doing it i mean there's a certain sense of pride and everybody's got each other's back and yeah definitely that's i'll tell you that's one thing that i miss from not being with a larger company anymore is just having that job site and that ability to get out there and like where you're at and just take a call, listen to the backup alarms, man, that is so beautiful. I have to, I have to find the YouTube versions now of backup alarms. My wife thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right. You just sit there and play it in the background, like a white noise machine. That's good. What, tell me this, what, what job site or where are you in the country? So I don't want to give away the uh, client because normally we don't talk about it, but I am, I'm down in uh, North Carolina around the Raleigh area. So we, our company has an office down here and it's a pretty big job site we have. So uh, yeah, I come down here periodically to, to help and help the team out and help where I can. I happen to be down here this week. The Carolinas, it's a very good place to be. I'm sure. Uh, I know. I'm sure you'll enjoy it more often. You, you should consider moving down here. We're good people now. I know, right? I feel like the last, I don't know, five or six months I've been down here more than I've ever been my whole life. Not just for work, obviously coming down and visiting you and then just in general, traveling down south a little bit more, but it is, it's nice. I'll tell you that right around this time of year too, it's when the weather starts changing up north, it's definitely a little bit nicer to come down here with the, considering I'm sitting outside right now and it's about 65 degrees and sunny where, although I think up north right now around the Boston area, it's probably similar just because we're going through a little bit of a, a warm spell, but in general, it's going to be much nicer down here than it is up in Boston. So a nice little escape from time to time isn't a bad thing. We're very welcoming. I promise you that. So tell, tell me a little bit more about your experience through construction. I know you've, you've been in the industry for a while. How did you get introduced into the industry and how'd you go through life to where you are now? Yeah, the, how I actually got introduced to it is an interesting one because I mean, growing up, my family wasn't really in it. My dad was in our, in the army. He was kind of in electronics and things like that. And was kind of a teacher at one, one of the local bases in Massachusetts. My grandfather is a farmer. So I have the farming in the background with Christmas trees. So ask me questions about Christmas trees and I know way more than I need to. Amazing. I love it. But so I, I kind of got started growing up, going up for the summers and Christmas break and things like that and helping out on the tree farm. And so I still have it painted in my brain, the layout of all like 50 or so acres that they had for the tree farm of where all the different types of trees are on that lot. But, Let me ask this question. Have you yeah. pull planned or do you have a process on how to cut down a Christmas tree? 
So I haven't pull planned because I'm going to say embarrassingly, I think since I've been in construction and kind of out of college, I don't know if I've actually gone and cut my own Christmas tree. For, yeah. yeah, there's, I know, I know. What a family, um, their family would be mad at you, man. My goodness. They would, they would. No, I know. So, I mean, it, we, we ended up selling off, the family ended up selling off the Christmas tree farm when I think it was just finishing up high school. So it kind of got out of the family, but then when it comes to you, you go off to college and then you graduate and it's like, I got a little apartment, so I'm not going to go and cut a tree down to bring it into the apartment. And when my wife and I first got married, we had a little condo. So there wasn't always the space for the, the Christmas tree. So the last smell. couple of years, hmm. no, I know the last couple of years we've been going to an actual tree farm and getting a real tree. But so, yeah, so that's, that's, a long-winded excuse. I know it is an excuse, but yes, I, it's, like I said, kind of embarrassingly, I haven't actually cut down my own Christmas tree in a long time. Well, take me down. You surely have a process of it, right? Of course. I mean, you know, you got to find the tree that makes sense for you. So depending on what you like within a Christmas tree uh, yeah. is the, right, exactly. What, what do you value in the Christmas tree? Some people like the look, some people like the smell, some people like a, a, a mix of both of them, but that's going to depend on what Christmas tree you go pick out. And then it's a matter of going and finding it, how tall you're going for, yeah. how, how wide the, the tree actually is, so the logistics of it all. And then you got to just bring the saw up. And I know at least at the, the family tree farm that we had, we had all the manual bow saws. So if you're going up the hill, you're grabbing a bow saw if you didn't have one, but they had plenty of them there in the shed. And then for some folks who didn't want to actually cut their own tree, one of us younger kids would end up going up with them and be the be the one to go up underneath the tree and, and saw the thing down. So you got to go through all the thought process behind picking a tree and then going up and actually going down there and chopping the tree where there's still a little bit of a stump left on the ground, but also there's enough trunk underneath it too. So you can fit it into the, uh, the actual stand afterwards. But, did you take your trees and like shake all the bugs out and wrap it up and do all that too? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So you end up bringing it down and then you put it on the little, the shaker thing or whatever. For a while they, we didn't have an actual like automatic thing. So you just kind of shake the tree a little bit. You like just you push the, exactly the put the needles down, but then you'd, you'd pull it through the, the bailing machine. So you just kind of, depending on the size of it, put it through, kind of tie up the, the netting on the, the backside of it and then just pull that thing through and, and net the, net the tree up so that would fit nicely on someone's car but All yeah right. it was a it's it's a it's a good time george sure. the christmas rebellion no wonder i wouldn't if i were you i wouldn't have a christmas tree either man to be honest with you i went down and <laughs> cut hundreds of other people's christmas trees like no no thank you we're getting a plastic one sorry yeah well i mean so i do i do actually have a a, a plastic one that my father gave me so it's actually a tradition in the family that we actually give like as the kids in the family kind of get old enough, like 18, 19, and then they start buying their own places that they, they get bought basically a fake Christmas tree for the house, so to speak. So I still have that, which is what we put up for years. But like I said, we finally made the transition over where I'm like, okay, I'll put the work in to actually put a real Christmas tree in the house now. Get you a fake Christmas tree and a, a pine air freshener for your car and call it good, huh? Yeah, hey. no, not the same. Not exactly yeah. the same, but yes, it's, so it's I interrupted the best you, so way. You started your career as, as a tree farmer, right? Or, or that yeah. runs in your, in your genes. It does. Whereas, it runs what in else the genes. made you who you are? So honestly, the first time I think I thought about, you know, design and construction was in high school. I switched high schools about end of sophomore year, but in high school, I actually took a carpentry class. And when we were in the carpentry class, part of it was that the professor actually taught us how to draft up some some plans and diagrams and that led me to saying okay well i want to take the i think it was architectural drafting or something like that and just kind of progress along and take more classes and so between that carpentry class and then learning how to actually draft by hand got me into taking just about every class the, the school had to offer that was hands-on with architecture or carpentry or i took auto repair in high school and that just kind of spawned it into okay this is something where i'd actually like to, to pursue beyond this and I could see myself doing. And then when I ended up graduating, it was, well, let me apply to a couple colleges to go for architecture or, hey, if that fell through, it was either I'd 
go join the military because that's that runs in the family too. Or I, I, I would have gone and, and probably worked for a local HVAC company because my stepdad at the time, and he still is, he was, he's a pipe fitter and works for an HVAC company. So I was probably just going to go grab a job with him and work back for a while. So that that's kind of what got me into it. And then I ended up going to school for architecture and coming out and going the construction management route instead of the architectural route. But yeah, that's that kind of just spurred me into it. I think the whole the whole sequence of when I actually got interested in construction, I think, has been an evolution in my head because most people when they ask me that, I don't I never really remembered it. But on on some some nice thoughtful reflection, I finally realized what I think it was actually that class in high school, that first carpentry class I took, and that professor, Professor Linker, that was the man. He he kind of he made it fun and it got me hooked. So that's amazing how you can pinpoint it back to even just one teacher. Like, how cool is that? Like, huge shout out, Mr. Linker, you said? Yep, yep, Mr. Jack Linker. I think he he has since passed, I want to say, maybe five, ten years ago. But, yeah, he was uh, in the community, too. He was a great guy. Everyone knew a real personal guy, would joke around with you a lot. So, yeah, he was definitely... He was definitely one of my favorite teachers growing up, but yeah, he, he hundred percent influenced me into getting into it. What a cool memory. And then you actually, just cause I know you personally, you got out of it briefly and into software. Can you tell me what that trend, like what, what a different mindset, tell, take me through that transition. And then now back into the CM role from a lean perspective, help me understand just that up and down. Yeah. So. I mean, kind of like I said, I've always been curious. I want to learn stuff. And I like I like learning about kind of the bleeding edge of stuff. And when I came out of college, I jumped right into VDC. So I learned BIM and I was running models and coordination things for a while. You were so a learning that technology. Too? I was. Oh, I was. I yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel like all of us ended up being there at one point. But that, So that's kind of what started me into a really liking that technology and, and the new cutting edge type of stuff. But from there, it kind of went to different practices and things people are doing. And so hearing about lean construction, I started getting into that. And then I think with the software piece, over the years, I'd gotten to know enough software vendors that for all the different stuff that you end up using in design and construction. And, you know, the, the stars aligned to a point where I was looking to make a move and Someone at the time was at one of the companies and said, well, we could really use somebody with your background and knowledge of the construction industry in general there, where come in and, and kind of talk to us on the software side and let us know what people are actually thinking out in the industry and help us grow this into something bigger than it is now and give us some good direction on it. And, and that to me was kind of like, okay, well, I've never worked for a software company. I have no idea what goes on on that side of the house of things, but it's super interesting. And I'm going to be able to kind of go and, you know, talk with a lot of people about problems that they have and how we can solve them for them and help out the, the people who are actually developing the software solve some of the problems that they might be having too, just by talking about experiences that I had. It's very intriguing to me. And I thought, well, why not? <laughs> it was kind of, it was right in the middle of the pandemic too. So it was kind of that spot where I feel like a lot of us were just kind of looking at work in general and saying like, what is work? What are we doing? We're, we're all remote and working from home and things like that. So that's kind of what led to it. And then I spent a year and a half working for a software company and learning a lot of what goes into that and a lot of the back end stuff that probably similar to how we look at design and construction projects now, the people who you never see actually building the building and things like that, when you end up walking through a beautiful space, you never actually think about the people who actually put it together most of the time. Same goes for stuff like software. There's a lot of people who put in a lot of hours and a lot of thinking time and everything to go into this to build something that then gets put out there to the general public that most of us end up just kind of taking for granted and saying, oh, it works on my computer, great. But then when something doesn't work, you kind of get, oh my God, what's going on? And it's like, but there's actual people behind that. I mean, who had to put it together. So I think that was that was the really cool part for me is being able to see how the sausage is made, kind of a thing behind the curtain of everything that goes into it. So that was a, that was a nice little learning experience for me. And then now, like you mentioned, 
I'm kind of back into the space of the construction world. So the firm I work for, we're a full service design, build and commissioning firm. So I'm not only getting to get some experience and, and help teams on the construction side, but also our design teams and then commissioning teams. And then the lucky opportunities we have where we get to have the full package of design all the way through to commissioning, such as this project that I happen to be on today gets you into a new space where you can start to think about how can we realize a lot of the, the grand ideas that we talk about a lot, but are always, you know, well, we can't really do it because the contractual nature of how the designer is to the con contractor. It's like, well, when it's all under one roof and, and it's all the same company, some of that stuff tends to go away. And so the, the opportunity to do something different and to do something better is there. And it's really exciting for me now. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at now. I love what you were saying about not seeing the people that make the software as well as not seeing the people that make the building. You also don't see the people that grow the Christmas tree, right? You don't see the people that put the time, effort, and energy into making that big luscious tree. You just see an experience that cut down and enjoy for a month and then you toss it to the curb and wait for the next one, right? So it's a very similar, I guess, pattern there doing things different. I love where you're at. You're talking about, you have a full, the full gamut, right? It's all under one roof, one umbrella. You're able to bring and truly integrate all pieces of construction, which is a true godsend. And you've got experiment after experiment. Now, I think you've got a, a super awesome, just set of experiences. I think that's why I gravitate to you. Do you love doing things different and better? What I heard. And I know I saw you recently in New Orleans. What what did you learn or what were some of your takeaways from LCI, the Congress that we had there a couple of weeks ago? What are you going to take from that or what have you taken and applied to your jobs? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me with LCI from this year, aside from the venue and just the general vibe of New Orleans was my first time down to New Orleans. I mean, the city, the culture, everything down there, it's so... I mean, it's so different from where I'm from up in Boston, which is why I love traveling in general, just to see the different stuff. But aside from that, the the conference itself, again, I think was very successful. And I think what I took out of it, because this time around, I feel like I was doing a lot more talking with folks and networking and, and meeting a lot of people who I really only talked to virtually or, or through LinkedIn and things like that. I think one of the biggest things that I got out of it was that there's so many people doing so many different things and, and whether they're trying you know, the, the latest when it comes to lean tools or they're just building upon what's already there for foundational stuff, there's so much stuff out there that we have to make sure that we take the mindset that we share as much as possible. I mean, it, it's like even LCI is a great example of it because I feel like as, as a community, everyone goes there specifically to share, but not any one person or one company or one region can really discover and move forward the industry by themselves. It is different areas are doing different things. And so to hear about what they're doing, the West Coast might be trying something that over here on the East Coast, we wanted to, but we haven't got there yet. So let's learn from what they did already. So then when we get to the point of trying it, we, we're, we're one step ahead, right? But then we also share it back. And I think that's what's great about Congress is there's so much of that do, going on. But just, yeah, the, the big thing for me was that there's, there's so much out there that we really do need one another out there in the industry to, to share and to talk about this stuff and just listen to one another what's going on because we can learn so much and we need each other to learn from each other, but then also learn for each other. Because like I said, no one person or, or one company or anything like that can learn everything on top of it. So if we're going to, we're going to try and move the needle at any point towards the better, I think we, we need to make sure that we're completely utilizing everyone to, to learn and then share that out. Yeah. Tell us, tell us what things you're doing to really just pour gasoline on that fire and spread lean throughout the communities. What, like, how is George Hunt helping that fight? I try to every way I can. I mean, even just since Congress, there's, there was a couple connections that I was finally able to meet in person. And we didn't really get a ch chance to connect and talk too much. And so I've had calls with people in all different parts of the country who were like, hey, what can we sit down for five minutes? Because there was something that I, I heard you guys talking about in your your TAC planning course on Tuesday morning. 
and I wanted to dive a little deeper into it. It's like, sure, let's let's take some time. You know I mean, and, and sit down and talk. So I've had a couple of those conversations, and I try to do that as much as I can when when I have the time to do it. But then also, I'm involved with the local community practice for LCI with New England, and so I've been on the core group for a few years, and just trying to get out into the community and put things out there for people to become aware of it who might not be aware of what lean construction is or that there's even a better way to do what we're doing now. I think that's that's part of the issue is that sometimes you don't even realize there's a better way to do it. So just kind of getting out there locally, but then also trying to put content out there and bring people to talk about things that people find value in within the community with the New England region, specifically with the community practice. It's been going for a good amount of years now, but I think we've seen a little bit of a, a dip when it comes to folks showing up to events and things like that. And so we're, we're trying to do some introspection in, in-house to see what's going on and what, what do we need to do to, to bring more value to those people who have, they, they did come years ago, but now they don't show up as much anymore. And and to say like, okay, well, what, what can we do? What can we put on that would actually make you guys come back and get value out of it without trying to alienate the people who are just learning about it too. So I think that's, that's kind of where we're at, but in general, yeah. I mean, I think I, I try and do as much as I can that I got free time to do. <laughs> I think it, it's one of those things where I, I definitely enjoy talking about lean construction and just construction in general. And I mean, I enjoy talking. <laughs> we'll say it, it ends up being, it's one of those things that I actually have to tell myself to stop doing sometimes. One of the, the things that I'm getting better at. Whenever anyone asks me a question of, hey, what is this or what is that? I gravitate towards it and say, oh, great. Like, you want to listen? Great. Let's sit down and have a conversation. And so just trying to talk with as many people who want to listen and hear about things. I'm all game. That's that's what I try and do as much as I can. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, believe me, by no means am I accusing you of not giving back to the community because I see you out there all the time, constantly encouraging. I mean, you're on job sites, you're giving presentations at these, you're a part of that unconference all day, which was huge. Tell us a little bit about that and your experience because that, that for me was one of the biggest takeaways I had from LCI. Tell me more about the unconference and what that felt like. Yeah. So that was really, really cool, I think. So the unconference, for those who weren't there or have never heard of it, it's it's really just a different kind of experience at a conference. The name kind of sets itself. It's not a conference, but it's a way to get people that are going to these things involved more and really harness the collective knowledge of the people who are actually attending the conference, not just your usual, we have the quote unquote expert speakers at the front of the room and they're presenting to you. There's a bunch of different ways that that whole unconference kind of unfolded and was able to get people involved in having discussions. And I thought it was great because like I said, for the most part with conferences, you go and you show up and you, you hear from people presenting, which is amazing in and of itself to learn about what they did. And then you usually have questions at the end, but there's never really much of a back and forth dialogue and bouncing ideas off of each other. And what I found that with that unconference, which kind of started with uh, why lean, and then it went into why not lean, and then kind of the future of lean in terms of topics. It was really just a great way to get people in a room and hear from everyone what their thoughts were on it, and then start to come up with ideas and brainstorm. And I mean, just looking back at the, the notes and the things that people put, it's like, wow, there was a lot of brain dump of information and knowledge and thoughts and brainstorming that went on there. You can't imagine how many hours would have gone into us on an individual level at our companies trying to think that stuff up. And and within a day, we just came up with all of these ideas and all of these thoughts with all all the people in the room. I mean, I, I can't imagine how many people actually went through all of the sessions combined. And then obviously the facilitators for that, they did a great job of moving things along and keeping us going and keeping everyone kind of entertained and on point. But I thought that was a great experience as well. And I think definitely we're actually thinking of potentially doing something like that locally to the New England region as we kind of brought up in a lean coffee we had a couple of weeks ago of, hey, what do people think about doing something like that around here? There might be something along those lines coming up around the New England region. So anyone around there, keep stay tuned. Look, look for the LinkedIn and the, the invites going out in the emails. But yeah, I think it's it was just something nice to see that was different that kind of broke the mold a little bit and really got people talking and getting some ideas out there that you could actually take some action on afterwards. 
Yeah, that's exciting. And I think the Carolinas might have to rip and deploy that maybe even before you get it done in New England. I really like that idea. Wait, so, and obviously things are working and we're starting to see a shift with one, just more people being interested in what lean construction is. And two, just the amount of energy and knowledge and just sharing going on within, I mean, you mentioned that earlier, the sharing that's happening. What is that like? What does that transformation feel like? What is the cultural change? I mean, is it is it going fast enough for you? What does that feel like? Well, I mean, in a general sense, I feel like the shift that we're seeing it's rewarding from a sense that I know that I contribute to that that change every day when you show up to the job site or you talk on podcasts like this or do a presentation like you were talking about, just knowing I try and show up and contribute to that change in a positive way. So from that standpoint, it's it's nice to see that it's actually at least progressing and it's going somewhere. Is it fast enough? I mean, it, is anything ever fast enough? Especially in design and construction, we can never get things done fast enough. But for, I think we, we also have to to look at what we're trying to change. And it's we'll even go centuries of a mindset where the people who are doing the work have, haven't been respected, haven't been looked at as being actual, the actual value creators within that process. And just a very top down hierarchy type of mentality. And that stuff doesn't change overnight, especially when it comes to changing people's minds and their thoughts and their behaviors. So from that standpoint, it's also, you got to look at it and say like, okay, we're not going to do this overnight. It's not going to be a very quick change because that change is something that's profound. It's not just a, Hey, I'm going to change the type of car that I drive, but it, it's also, I'm going to change the tools and the things that I'm doing, but also I have to change the way that I think about stuff and I have to change the way that I treat people and I have to change the way that I show up every day. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I kind of think I see things now, but to your point, yeah, it, it, it's positive because there is some change going on. I mean, you look at the the community just in general with, if you just look at LCI, that, that seems to be growing. It was great to see, I think there's what, however many people showed up this year to LCI, I mean, which, which is growing obviously with the, the pandemic and stuff like that going. So it's good to see everyone back. But in general, I think when you come to the job sites and talk to folks, they've at least heard something about it. Now, not everyone knows what that means. And I think there's also a little bit of kind of, we'll say level setting when it comes to when someone hears lean, because a lot of times people will hear the word lean and they'll automatically go to sticky notes on a wall, which- Bullshito. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And there's a lot of that stuff that's out there, which happens with every sort of movement of any sorts and change that's going on is you're going to get the stuff that is broadcast to the masses and the, the message gets a little bit skewed. And so there's, there's part of that of coming back to it and, and trying to do what we can to say, no, listen, like it's, it's not sticky notes on a wall, right? There, there's a mindset behind this. That's much bigger than that. And it's a, it's a cultural thing around the people and the, the building of your capabilities and where one, where it, it, it does, it's a benefit to everyone involved is I think the biggest thing too, because, um, you know, right now it, you talk to different people on the job site. Some people think, oh, it's because the GC wants to do it. Oh, the owner's pushing it on us. It's really, if we're, if we're trying to do this, it's, it benefits everybody from the owners right down to the people working on the actual job site with the, the hammer or the screw gun or whatever it is they're doing. It's if we can get it instilled in us the way that we would want to ultimately it benefits everyone out here so yeah it's slow moving but it is moving in the right direction i feel like at least all right george cut through the bullshito now what if i so i'm just learning about this lean thing right like what do what do you want me to do where am i supposed to start george yeah so my thing is always if if you're looking for a place to start start with yourself is you you really only have control over yourself. So look at how you approach situations and approach other people in the way that you're looking at them. Very often we we look at, at everyone else as their their tools to help us get to a goal. So understanding that people are humans, people are people, right? They're real, they're there. They're not just a tool or a machine or anything like that. And and the way that you approach it, I think is is one thing you can do to start and just understanding and, and really valuing people for being people and human beings, which is all the good with the bad, right? Because as humans, we're, it's not all just good and happy sunshine roses, right? We, 
we show up and there's things that go on where we turn into bad moods and we have, we have traits that aren't aren't the best for everybody. So accepting that and kind of understanding that about everyone is a place you can start with yourself, but then also looking for ways that you can do things on a small scale with yourself to improve on everything, right? Instead of going to someone else directly and saying, hey, let's improve this process. You should improve this process. You should improve that process. I feel like it's, it's, it's much more within your control to turn and find something that you're doing to improve. And you're probably going to see results more so than you will if you're going to someone else and telling them to improve. And it, and it also kind of cuts through that bullshito piece because it's not, lean isn't something that you're, you're trying to do to other people. I mean, or do for other people like lean really is that mindset that people need to be in about how you, you interact and you treat others and you from the past and to improve. And so getting yourself in that headspace, I feel like first is where I would start. And then you can start to look at, all right, how do I, how do I spread this to others? Right. How do I introduce other people to it? The concepts are different tools and whatever it might be. But I always say, try and start with yourself first, because at the end of the day, that's all you really have control over. Now you can't, you can't control other people. You can really only control yourself and the way that you think and the way that you act. So it's really the only thing that you can actually do is start with yourself. I fought that one for a long time. My good buddy, Jesse Hernandez, said, control is an illusion. And I, I fought that for so long and I was like, oh, that's BS. That's BS. Control is an illusion, folks. You do not have, if you do have control over somebody, you might be going to jail because I'm pretty sure that's illegal. You don't have control over people. You cannot make them do things. You can encourage them. You can influence them. You can, you have the ability to persuade, but you absolutely do not have control over people. So I love what you're saying, George, Sir George Hunt, lean construction. Take me through. So that's probably one of the best answers to that question I've ever received. I really, really like where your head's at. Can you describe what you think a lean builder is for me? So I think a lean builder is someone who approaches their job site, their workspace, whatever it is, every day with, we'll call it the respect for people, right? Without trying to unpack that entire entirety of what respect for people means but the real meaning behind the respect for people. So they, they approach it every day with that respect for people and the desire to want to improve on something that they're doing, right? And I think the part for me that I'll stress on is that desire and the, the will to want to improve on anything that, that they're doing, because I think from a, a realistic standpoint, it's it's very hard to actually go every single day and say, okay, I'm improving this today and I'm improving this today. So. I feel like starting at least with, I want to improve something today, but we know life gets in the way. Sometimes things happen. So, Hey, I was planning on, on trying to improve this. I didn't get to it because six other RFIs just came in and I had to do it. Um, but at least, right. Exactly. The root of all evil. That, that, that one's coined by Colin Milberg himself. Oh, I like um, it. It's not money. It's yeah. actually variation. Variation. Variation is the root of all evil. Love it. We just um, had Colin on too. That's awesome. Yes. That's great. But yeah, it is, is showing up with that respect for people and then with that desire to improve on what you're doing. And that could be, you're doing something safer, you're doing something faster, better, whatever that definition of improvement is for what you're doing is it, just trying to approach things from that perspective. That, that to me is what a lean builder is. You know, what's funny is this same conversation came up on the, on the podcast with Colin and, and his mustache, which is like unbelievably awesome. But we yep. talked about the differences in desires and action or planning and execution. And there's a whole nother level if you're just planning, just scheduling versus executing and protecting the plan and making things happen. And so definitely takes both of those. And I love where you're at. Again, the lean builder is, I'm curious real quick, your respect for people comment, because you and I kind of giggle and we know what's going on, but explain that just as briefly, you don't have to get passionate and throw your headset, but mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about respect for people without dominating the episode on it. Yeah. So. I mean, to me, it, the respect for people part goes, the more I've learned about it and read about it and heard from folks who, who talk about it is it really, 
at least from a, a Western world perspective, it's something a lot more, it, a lot deeper than I think a lot of the concepts we have here are, right? Because it is, it does come from that, the Japanese culture and, and that the thought behind it is that we're, we're valuing humans for being humans and kind of keeping, holding dear what it is to be a human being, you know? And so that statement of, an, of itself is like, what do you actually mean by that, right? It, it's such a, it's a very deep kind of a, a thoughtful type of a term, but I think in practical terms, it's just, it's understanding that every single one of us is different and we all have our own internal dialogues and our own internal thoughts and opinions and desires. And like I said, the good with the bad. So we have those cognitive biases that we aren't aware of. And we all have the blind spots and things like that, that you do need others to help you with. And so keeping that thought in your brain and in your mind when you're interacting with people. So not going and treating them as they're some autonomous being or some sort of a tool that you need to do something so that you can get to your outcome, but rather approaching them like a person and talking through with them and saying, hey, if you're asking them to do something, be like, can you do this for me? Hey, we need this done. What else is going on in your life, your day, whatever? I mean, instead of just throwing something on someone's desk and being like, hey, get this done. And just taking that extra step to understand that as much as we have our own thoughts and things going through our heads, other people are doing that too. And, and like I said, it, it's without going on a diatribe for a, a, an entire episode in and of itself, it, is that's really the part of it for me. It's just kind of understanding here that we're, we're all in this together. We all have something to contribute and, and just taking that extra second to acknowledge that in our heads and then act upon it in that nature too is acknowledge that and, and when, we, when we talk to one another. All, all humans want to add value to this world. And it's our For job sure. as leaders to figure out how we enable that and empower that to happen. So for sure, you're on fire, man. I love it. Tell me this, because I, I know you've been in the industry for a while now. I want to hear either your best memory, a funny story, a good lesson. What What's kind of your takeaway from the industry over the last probably 20 years or so you've been in? Yeah. Oh boy. Memories. So, I mean, there's a lot of memories I probably shouldn't share out loud. <laughs> it, the early days when I was assistant super on site a lot, there was, there's a lot of hijinks and things that went on that I probably can't share, but I think the, the best, the best memory for me was that stands out at least was the first job I was on as out in the field as an assistant super. So I was in VDC for a while and then I, I transferred over and kind of merged myself into a, an assistant superintendent using BIM and VDC out in the field at the same time with things. And that first job that I was on from start to finish, it was typical for the New England region, but it was an old mill renovation, it's like 230,000 square feet total. There was like seven or eight different buildings. They're all getting turned over into apartments and condos. But working through that year and a half or so that we were on that project with that team, and then seeing everyone at the end of it for that grand opening that they had, kind of show up and relax and kind of let their hair down, so to speak, and actually enjoy each other's company and be talking about how like proud they were of that project. Like that's, I think the biggest standout moment for me was that being able to see that as a, a microcosm of a community just on that project itself was that everyone who worked on that was proud of doing what they did. Whether it was the, the men and women who were screwing track down into the floor for the walls, or it was the person putting in plumbing piping, or it was the, the architect or the people finishing tile off, whatever it was, everyone was proud of the work that they put in there. And to be able to see the finished product and be able to see everyone at the end of it, kind of sit together, relax, and just talk about things and, and talk about, yeah, like this, there was another one joking around, hey, we survived another one kind of a thing. But seeing the pride in everyone's faces and their voices when you got to the end of it, I think that definitely stuck with me. And it for sure is one of the driving reasons why I'm still doing what I'm doing is that, that joy that I think I, I got from that moment of being able to say like, okay, we're, we're part of a, a community here who is very proud of what they do. And quite honestly, is you can't have our world without what the design and construction community does. And so... I think that that's probably the standout moment for me. 
Hell yeah. With the, uh, and so to your credit, those jobs are not easy. I, we have a bunch of those old mill buildings around here from when the textiles left and went overseas. Mm -hmm. And there are so many nooks and crannies and hidden little laboratories and uh, so shot and as hazardous materials, et cetera, that you're having to deal with carcinogens in the soil oil. Cause they, you probably had a train or, and, or some type of water next to it. And so those, and, and the historical yeah. preservation society, I'm sure was oh, yeah. involved in one of the yep. windows in a specific way. And oh my yep. goodness. Oh yeah. Plenty of challenges. Those, those jobs are the worst, but, but it is like, and especially they're powerful, like you said, to the local community, because usually those, those plants or those manufacturers bought the local community around them had houses and everything. And it, that was the community. And so when you're able to breathe life back into a community like that, that's huge. And I love how that just plays into lean and everything that we're doing on that front as well. So. We're coming down towards the end. I got a couple more quick things, but I want to make sure we've hit everything that you've got. What, is there anything, any message, any special thing you want to get out there? No, I think I talked about a little bit when I talked about my takeaways from LCI there, but just I, I would urge the community out there, whether you are someone who follows lean construction or anything in general, just get out there and, and ask questions and learn from one another. Like I said, even if it's not, something that you would consider a lean construction tool or anything like that. Just take a walk around the job sites or, or the office and see what other people are doing and then try and learn from people. I think that's, that's the biggest thing for me that I, I want to try and get out there because without learning from one another, we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to be spinning our tires forever here. And I mean, we can't do that, right? We're at, we're at a point in humanity here where I don't think we can just keep spinning our tires. We got to, we got to start learning from one another. So. Those are famous hoots on the ground words out on the job site is, Hey man, will you teach me something? And people yeah. look at you like, what the hell are you talking about at first? Yeah. But then after a while they start to expect it and it becomes pretty cool, especially when they start hitting you back with that question and you can bring them in and teach them something that you might know that they might not. And the relationship really mm -hmm. develops. I love that. Take me through what, what's one thing, one word or a phrase or something like that, that just bothers you or irks you. Sir George. Oh boy. I think for, for a phrase of something like that, I think a lot of times the phrase like prove it or show me, I think bothers me sometimes. Interesting. And I think in, in not all scenarios and from what that I mean is there's a lot of times where I don't think we give credit to people who have done either the research or they've gone through and done the work to understand that something is, is going to be beneficial before we immediately scoff at it and say, well, it's different from what I'm doing. Like, show me that it actually works. I mean, when in actuality, what they might be proposing isn't that dramatic of a change and trying it actually isn't going to be that much of a burden, but from a standpoint that we can only improve with it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? It is even just the... I've had people on job sites be like, well, we're not going to do our, our daily end of day stand up with everyone. I'm going to go and just check in with people, but it, it doesn't matter. I, I, I know what's going on here as an example and, and just completely scoff at the idea of like, no, like let's bring everyone together for 15 or 20 minutes have people talk through what they're doing and what they need from each other. And it, and it adds value to everybody. And now it, it becomes much more commonplace, but I remember first introducing that idea to some people and they're like, no way. Well, show me, show me why that's better, right? Prove to me why it's better. And sometimes you, you got to go through that, but that, that, that saying kind of prove it or show me, I think irks me sometimes when it comes to that, because even when, when there's, there's simple things that we're, we're asking people to look at, but just the immediate response of, oh, well, prove, prove to me that it makes sense or show me that it works before I'm going to um, trust you that it actually is better for the, uh, for the betterment of all of us. I think that that would be one thing that I would say irks me sometimes. Keep George out of Missouri. That's the show me <laughs> thing. It might, yeah. it might be some offense there. Well, yeah. What else, man? Go out with a mic drop. What do you want to say maybe to the, to the folks just coming into the industry, maybe to the folks who have been into the industry, to those who are changing or those who don't want to, like where do you, anywhere you want to take this mic drop me, Take it out on your on your note here. What do you have to say to the Lean Builder Nation? Yeah, I mean, I would say that for those who are already trying to make change, keep it up. I know 
it, it seems sometimes like you're banging your head against the wall. Unless in some situations you might be banging your head against the wall, but sometimes it, it's what we need to do to, to get through a little bit and make a little bit of a, a push. And to those who are just coming in the industry and, and looking at this, like, wow, I don't know, there, there's a lot of things that are, I don't like about this or whatever. I, I would say this, that being new to the industry means that you also don't have the bad habits that the industry's in, and which means that you're in a unique position to be that instrument of change that you want to see. So if you're coming in to a situation and you're new to it, approaching it at least in a respectful manner to say, hey, can we maybe do something different here and, and trying to do what you can to, to make a little bit of a change. I would say put that out there as folks who are new, who are coming into the industry and a little challenge to them. I mean, is that it's not, we also have to look at it that if you're coming into something it's not necessarily what can this, what does this industry have for me in it? What, what is it going to give to me? It's, we also have to do our own due diligence to say, well, what am I going to give back to the industry? What am I going to do to, to better further it along? And it doesn't need to be huge. I mean, listen, all of us doing something a little bit makes a big difference. And I think there's plenty of anecdotes about that doing, doing just a little bit. And if we're all doing our little bit of a part, we can make a big push. So yeah, that's what I would say as a, as a closing point there is that those who are doing it, keep doing it. We're doing something and we're making some change. And those who haven't yet and are, are looking to get into it, just th think of ways that you can be that change agent. Although it's hard sometimes, I think it's, you gotta, it's, it's kind of our responsibility to do what we can other than just kind of going along and, and taking everything from, from an industry that, like I said, we can't, we can't have a, have a society without the design and construction world. So do it, do what you can to, to help move it forward. Be the change that you want to see. I love it. Sir George Knight, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time, your energy, all the love, man. I just, you're the man. Thank you for blessing us with your presence and continue to change the industry. I love what you're doing. I'm a huge fan. No, thanks so much for having me. And I'm glad I'm hoping someone will be able to take something out of the conversation we had here. So awesome. No, thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm.